Welcome to episode two of the MindShift podcast, where today we are thinking about the book of Ecclesiastes, what a strange book it is in the biblical canon, very philosophical. And I wanted to explore those philosophical themes a bit deeper, whether it's existentialism or nihilism or absurdism. So I recruited some help from one of my favorite philosophy channels, Unsolicited Advice. We try to stay on topic through the book of Ecclesiastes, but we get into a lot of other philosophical elements in comparative literature and philosophy. If that sounds good to you, stick around. And without further ado, here's episode two. Joe, how are you? You doing? Oh, I'm doing well, thanks. Thank you for having me on. I've got a bit of a cold, but I can't complain. That's okay. If anything, it just makes that wonderful British accent sound even a little more hefty. Yeah, I feel like I trade quite a lot on the British accent on the channel. I feel like, you know, that is vanity <laughs> in, in, in both senses of the word. We'll be getting to that for sure, because actually I am going to solicit some advice from you today. We are going to be talking about Ecclesiastes. And I want to get to you and your channel and your background a bit more. But to start off, I would love to hear from you on why should we be talking or thinking about Ecclesiastes and all the philosophy that comes with it? Yeah, so I think that um, Ecclesiastes, I think, is, is is a great book basically for anyone to read. I mean, I'm, I'm an atheist myself, and it, I think it's one of the most pertinent books of the Bible for atheists, because it deals with a lot of existential themes that will then become very, very important later on, you know, um, primarily in the kind of 19th century, but prefigured a, a long way before then. And yes, and as a result, it ties into these really timeless questions about, you know, how to live a good life, what constitutes a meaningful life and what is the role of religion in that? Which appears to be a question that's kind of come back into focus now. I see increasingly this sort of question of, oh, well, you know, we have this problem with emerging problem of nihilism, maybe, and what's the role of, of, of religion or faith in, in, in potentially combating that? Or will it just, you know, make it worse? Because, you know, that's also a, a, a potential perspective in the kind of debate around, ah, you know, nihilism versus religion. There are also thinkers, Nietzsche's one of them, who says, no, actually, it's, it's, it's religion is not contra nihilism. Religion was laying the groundwork for nihilism. You know, they're timeless questions, but they're also taken on increasing contemporary relevance, which is why I think Ecclesiastes is such a great book in the Bible. It's also just a wonderful tone shift, which I, I find just really, really charming. It's like you end, pro- I've got my Bible in front of me, you end Proverbs with give her the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. And then you turn the page and it's a vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's so dramatically, it's like a kind of throw back the curtain and, and something is revealed. No, I appreciate that. I echo it. And I think it's really funny that two atheists are having a Bible study right now. We're just sitting here. But uh I'm thrilled to talk to you because your background, you have a master's in philosophy from Cambridge. So I think we're attacking this from two angles, and we're looking at both the biblical case for the book as well as the philosophical case for the book. And I'm really interested to see where we agree, where we disagree. The other thing that I think is fascinating about Ecclesiastes is... (laughs) I've probably read it 14, 15 different times, maybe more, you know, throughout the course of my entire Christian career, if you want to call it that. And then in the last five years since my deconversion. And every single time, I think it applies to a different philosophy. Sometimes I think it's the stupidest book. It's a cope. It's just this big, you know, it's all about uh, following God. That's it. it. It's fear God and obey his commands. That's how the book ends. And then other times I'm like, no, this is, was this like a was this like an early atheist that snuck something into the canon? Like, this is amazing. And and so I go back and forth on the book all the time. I have all these different perspectives floating around in my brain. And you get to be the first person that I have a chance to kind of iron some things out with. So I'm excited. Oh, to, wonderful. I, I look forward to it. Yeah, I'm excited to work together on it. I do want to talk about you and your channel really quick. You oh, yeah, have different. been on YouTube for about a year. Yeah, like kind of April last year, I started like thinking, oh, wait, I need, I need to kind of think about how I'm going to do this. Yeah. So, yeah. Started uploading a bit more regularly. Yeah. You've got over 100 videos, 10 million views, over 230,000 subscribers. And I think it's all well attributed. This isn't some weird early success. I think your videos are phenomenal. They're all under 30 minutes. For the most part, you have a couple longer ones. It's not just let's talk about nihilism. It's let's talk about this philosopher and this personal aspect of the philosopher and how that relates to nihilism. But your most recent video was the problem of suffering, I believe, correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Problem of evil. I thought it's kind of, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice problem. I, I enjoy chewing it. It's, it's, I find it very interesting because the problem of evil was totally irrelevant to why I became an atheist. Mm. So I, I, I you know, it's, my atheism was entirely sort of, oh, I just, I just suddenly was like, I can't see a good argument for God's existence. You know, I was, I was like combing through Aquinas and I was like, well, there must be one. And I was like, oh, you know, this is all fine, but it all relies on this kind of Aristotelian metaphysics in the background that I don't quite buy into. And, you know, so, so I was sort of, that, that was, so in some ways the problem of evil is a really fun thing to discuss for me because I, I kind of don't really have any horse in the game. That's so interesting. Yeah. If it's after the fact, the problem of, it's funny because I used to say the problem of evil and then it was Alex O'Connor who I know you actually just were on his show, but he had a debate one time and he said, oh, it's really not fair to say evil if I don't believe in the concept of evil. And so he kind of, and maybe he got it from someone else, but he was the first time I heard him say, we should 
talk about this as the problem of suffering, which I think does have a, a more neutral ring to it than than evil. Yeah, no, I suppose it, in, in, in effect, it is often posited as a problem of suffering, right? You know, there's often responses to it. Uh, oh, yeah, there is suffering, but it's for some greater good. You know, in fact, this this kind of evil, the evil was an illusion. Mm, for sure. And so, yeah, you, you recently did the interview with Alex and you guys spoke about nihilism. And in the first couple minutes, you actually brought up, or I think Alex brought up Ecclesiastes. And you guys didn't talk about it very much. And I was like, oh, thank goodness, because I really want to talk to Joe about this. <laughs> but just enough that I, I saw how you perceived it leaning into nihilism. And I do want to talk about that. But first, tell us a little bit about your your channel. Oh, yeah. So, so my, I mean, our channel is called Unsolicited Advice, um, because I don't, you know, I don't like to be too presumptive with what I say. And um, uh, yeah, I, I just cover, I, I cover basically whatever, whatever takes my fancy, but it kind of has a leaning towards existential philosophy with the idea of making a central philosophy as precise as possible, but no more precise than that. Ooh. And my background is mainly in logic. I'm very used to being like, oh, this is fine. We can just like, we can take this and we can make a kind of pseudo mathematical model for it and see how it works and, and kind of pick it apart that way. And one of the things that drew me to existentialism as, as a field was just because I was like, oh, well, you can't really do it with here. There, there's this inevitable, almost irreducible subjective sort of phenomenological component to it. And I found that really interesting because I got so used to being like, oh, here's a philosophical issue. Here's a logical model. And, you know, they kind of mesh together quite nicely. Yeah, I was going to actually point that out because it seems a bit oxymoronic to have this discipline in logic and then go to maybe the most illogical branches of philosophy. I don't know if that's fair to say, but kind of like what you just said, I, I think existentialism mm. is something that's very hard to pin down. And there's so many iterations of it and branches of it that I'm not sure, maybe I'm conflating terms here, but exactly how you would make a logical model like that. It poses special difficulties because of this kind of overarching emotional component, right? It's, it's also the thing that draws me to existentialism is that it's an eminently practical philosophical discipline. Most people at some point will ask something like, you know, why am I here? Like have this almost stereotypical example of somebody, you know, reaching midlife and, and thinking, oh no, I've wasted the last 50 years and now I'm, I feel terrible and I, I can't shake this feeling. Mm. And, um, and increasingly, people are talking about quarter life crises. So I suppose there's there's been this kind of existential crisis inflation, and it will eventually reach sort of ten year olds. But um, but you know, I I just think that the enduring nature of existential issues um, fascinates me. My kind of fun fact, I suppose, is that the Epic of Gilgamesh features an existential crisis. You yeah. know, this kind of oldest surviving semi complete work of literature. And has an existential crisis in. I go, you know, that that's that's an that's an old problem and a problem that probably isn't going to go away anytime soon. Um, and I also think that you know, uh, this may this may be showing my hand a bit much here, but I I kind of suspect that existential problems will become even more important as we perhaps move into the latter part of the twenty first century. Because I mean, this is this is like pure speculation. Yeah, no, I want to hear. Um, it. But as certain things, like uh, one of my friends works in AI, so he's always talking about AI. And I always, you know, one of the things about AI that people don't necessarily often talk about is this kind of existentially threatening component to it. Not not kind of physical existential threats, but a kind of what's our place in the world? You know, since Aristotle, we've been quite good at comforting ourselves, being like, oh, you know, we're the rational animal, we're the kind of the intellectual apex of the world. And then, you know, this at the moment it's just large language models. You know, I don't think anyone thinks a large language model is conscious, but but it's certainly really good at some things in a way that makes us kind of unsettled. And the idea that there might be there might be something that gets really like quite a lot better than us and qu quite a lot of things. Like a job used to be to be a human calculator, mm. like in the early right. 20th century. Exactly. Uh, the British employed lots and lots of um, human calculators in India. And you see these, like there, there are, you know, documents of how quick these people could do maths. And it was amazing. And, you know, and, and um, then the calculator came along and that's no longer a job. You know, I, I sometimes think, well, imagine how they felt. Like that's, mm. that's kind of a skill that they had and was brilliant. And probably, you know, they worked years to perfect. And we'd still consider really impressive. And suddenly it was, it was so much less valuable. Yeah, gone. Um, Not just less valuable, unneeded overnight. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and I think that to a certain extent, lots of existential crises are about this sudden, like, like a broken promise. We're told that something is valuable or is essential or is needed or is there. And then we find out, oh no, it might not be. And then... You know, haywire ensues. It's not only an economic issue, but it's also, I think, fundamentally an existential issue. Oh, that's perfect. I think that's fascinating. I'm tempted to just say, forget Ecclesiastes and let's talk about AI, but uh, I won't. I won't. I don't, I, I don't know nearly enough about AI. This is just me like sure. throwing out thoughts. Well, I think wind, that's where but... some of the most interesting thoughts come from. You know, I did, I, I tried to educate myself a few years back a little bit more. Like I read, who is it? Nick Bostrom's, I think it's called Super Intelligence. I don't know if you're mm. familiar with Nick Bostrom. He's a little, a little bit. I've read a couple of his papers. He's a little bit more of the 
the conspiracy theorist side of AI, I would say, you know, he's convinced that we're in a simulation and he gives his math for why it is actually the most likely outcome and things like this and warns mm. about the dangers of AI and all kinds of very interesting and, and fun things to think about, also terrifying. And like you said, the more that that comes into a realistic sphere, the more perhaps existentialism peaks up. However, I don't know if it's ever even had a valley or a peak. I think that since the beginning of mankind, I actually think existentialism, this might be, I, I need to think this out further before I just say it, but I'm going to. I think existentialism is probably the basis for all religion, right? Like we needed to fill the gaps of what we couldn't know about our existential dread and why we're here and giving purpose and meaning and morality and all of these things. And Nietzsche, to me, was my first time about understanding that when that religion goes away or potentially goes away, that this thing that was an answer, even if it wasn't the answer for our existential dread, needs to be replaced. And I see similar themes, if I'm going to try to bring this back on topic, in Ecclesiastes of trying to deal with this. And the worst part about Ecclesiastes, the thing I think that makes it the most interesting, is it's completely contradictory, not just to the rest of the Bible, but even within itself. Even within its 12 chapters, if it really was this nihilistic piece, you wouldn't have written it. If life really was this meaningless, there wouldn't be instruction in the book, right? And and so it it does not even take itself as seriously as it seems to endeavor to. So let's just get into it. Let's talk about Ecclesiastes. Tell me from the non-religious side, you know, you don't have the same biblical background that I do. What is your first takeaway when you read those 12 chapters and you put it down? The first time I read Ecclesiastes, I remember thinking this is such a an honest description of what an existential crisis might feel like. You know, like like you know, I think we've all had in many existential crises. But this is someone, as you say, I think the contradictory nature really elucidates this well. You know, at once he says it is better to be wise than foolish. And then he says, well, all wisdom is also meaningless. So that, you know, th those two points are at the very least, if not outright contradictory, they are in strong tension. And, you know, he has eat, drink and be merry. And also hedonism is also vanity and, and meaningless. The, one of the reasons why I really like it is because it really reads like somebody attempting to organize their thoughts. So, I, I mean, I recently did a, a video on Tolstoy's Confession. And it reads like quite similarly to that, where, you know, Tolstoy also goes through the same sort of structure of raising things that he thought were meaningful and then saying, well, actually, it turns out that was that was meaningless. And, you know, he brings up his riches and his family and, and, and his work. And he says, well, all of this ended up for nothing. And it's, it's very, very similar to Ecclesiastes. I don't know if that was I don't know enough to know if that was if that was liberal on Tolstoy's part. But that's the first thing that immediately struck me the first time I read Ecclesiastes. I like how much of a much playing with ideas that there, there is in there. And it also just hits upon so many of the of the classic points of existential philosophy. It actually hits on the combinational problem of us being mortal and there being injustice. Those two tie together quite nicely because if you're like Kant posited in his kind of wonderfully like Kantian way that there might not be immortality, but it is morally necessary to believe in immortality because he thinks we're on this kind of quest for moral perfection, both in the sense of personally, but also in the sense of bringing about his like ideal kingdom of ends. And he says, well, that obviously can't take place in, in our finite lifetimes because we die uh, at points where the world is still unjust. So he says, well, it must be, you know, we must then in order to, to keep our moral system afloat, believe in, in the immortal realm, which is, again, it's, it's very interesting. And I, and I almost think that he plays with like a similar set of ideas here, especially right at the end where he goes, you know, essentially his his answer to injustice is, well, God's judgment will eventually take care of it all. Wow. You said so many things I want to hit on already. I'm, I'm really looking forward. You know, one of the things that I love about your channel, Joe, is you script and your videos every second is necessary. Every word is seems to me, at least as the listener, to be chosen well. You are crafting an idea, but off the cuff, you seem to be just as good at conveying ideas. So, oh, thank you. Actually, I get very nervous talking off the cuff because uh, I, I, I kind of, I kind of have a meandering way of thinking. Well, but, everything okay. you just said, I really related to, and I think meandering is perfect for this book because <laughs> the perspective you just brought up. You know, I was here ready to criticize, right? I said it's contradictory, and you mm. look at the tension of someone working out their ideas in real time. And that's something that is so beneficial. You know, I see it and, and maybe we can talk about our methods when we make videos. But when I make a case against some particular point I want to do against Christianity for one of my videos, I want it to be airtight. I want to make sure I cover every possible objection. I want to make sure I'm not being internally inconsistent. But in the process of maybe thinking about a video and having those stupid thoughts, inconsistent thoughts, unfair thoughts. That's where a lot of the discovery happens. And I think that if we do look at this book, 12 chapters of some man or, you know, redaction, we can get into the background of it, trying to 
think out loud on a page. You might be able to have a little more empathy and sympathy for the inconsistencies and the ups and downs because it's it's human. It's very real. And mm. I think that's fascinating. The second point that I want to get to with you, and we should probably start at the beginning, but you kind of went to the end already, is that there needs to be this judgment for morality to work out. There needs to be more time. And this mm. is something that I don't fully understand from Ecclesiastes, and I don't know if you do, but I'd like to talk about it. And then we'll kind of go back and start from the beginning. It is said in Ecclesiastes at least twice that we don't know what happens when we die. And there's no reason to think we're different than the animal, which is a hilarious thing to be in scripture. And he does use the word sheol, which is the Old Testament, the Jewish idea of the afterlife, which is asleep. You've died and now you sleep with your fathers. It is not hell. It is not heaven. It is not purgatory. Those are later additions, most likely and specifically New Testament. And yet he continues to talk all the way through out of two sides of the mouth. Enjoy your life. This is all we have. There's nothing new under the sun. It's redundant. It's stupid. It's meaningless. Kind of this atheistic call of create your own meaning. But then, again, more towards the end, specifically 9 through 12, we get into this. It's all about loving God, fearing God, obeying God, otherwise judgment. But where does the judgment come if we just end in Sheol? Why not be hedonistic for all your days? And I'm curious, not even from a religious bend, but how do you think those two things work together. That sort of structure comes up, I think, a lot in existentialist literature. And I don't know whether it's a kind of problem solution thing. But yeah, there's this idea of like, oh, well, you know, we go into, you know, an eternal sleep, but that's kind of really unsatisfying. Right. Uh, at, le at least potentially very existentially unsatisfying. The thing that I pick up on with with the God, the stuff that God's judgment is doing here, it's doing something that, that a lot of existential philosophy does. Well, using existential philosophy in the really broad sense of like philosophy that deals with meanings of life is that it's placing the source of meaning or value kind of beyond us or be beyond kind of this well beyond the world under the sun mm -hmm. beyond the kind of material plane you know there's there's this, almost seems to be this this contrast of like well there's you know there's nothing new under the sun uh, everyone toils under the sun it's all for nothing and then you've got god's judgment which is in some ways supposed to solve this nietzsche really criticizes this idea he says that attempting to search for meaning beyond is a kind of superficial counter to nihilism, but in the long term will actually make the problem much worse because he thinks it will kind of disconnect us from life. He says that, you know, once you start placing origins of meaning beyond this world, I mean, encourages what he calls life denial and, and resentment. And he says, you mm -hmm. know, this it, it will it will discourage a thoroughgoing engagement with this reality. I know Nietzsche has this very interesting perspective, right? Because he doesn't think that he thinks that nihilism is at least partly a sort of illness of the will. So he views asking the question of what is the meaning of life already a sign that, you know, we're kind of too far gone. Something's oh. gone wrong almost physiologically. Yeah. And we need to crawl our way back. But he says that, you know, societally, the the move that the the author of or the, the preacher in Ecclesiastes is 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 making here, placing meaning beyond in God's commandments or in or in fearing God or God's judgment, something something out there that makes it all right. And Nietzsche would say is, is already sowing the seeds for nihilism. So there's a there's a kind of tension here. But but Nietzsche is pretty pretty unique there. Many, many um existential philosophers take this approach right where they they say you know um classically you know Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky they introduce god as meaning giving they do it in very different ways but but broadly speaking that's kind of part of their existential solution and Tolstoy does does a very similar thing that's what i mean it's there are lots of very very familiar moves in this that come up in other philosophies and that's that's one of them you know placing meaning beyond us and even that predate so many of, obviously, all the philosophers you just mentioned are, are authors or thinkers. And it's not entirely unique. I think we should probably look at what we do know about the book and what scholars think about the book. You know, the idea is that this is classic Jewish wisdom literature right up there with mm. Job and Psalms. But there's some ideas that it's Persian or even Hellenistic as late as that, and that it is borrowing from a whole lot of other later thinkers, and they try to map it back onto Solomon. Because again, the claim that is made about Solomon is insane. It is granted wisdom to the extent that no one before and no one ever since will be as wise as this man. And so if this is this man's thinking, first of all, it's problematic because for as much tension or whatever grace you want to give it, there's some silly things in here, things that don't work. So mm. <laughs> the wisest man that ever lived, like we, we would take issue. Also, if we do believe that he's the author, it brings more into tension the conflict with his other writings or that are attributed to him within the canon itself, as you mentioned before. You know, Proverbs to Ecclesiastes is such a stark <laughs> difference. Although there is one tied theme, both books boil down to fear God which I think is disgusting, personally. I think it is the biggest cop-out at the end of the day 
well, if there's a meaning maker, we have to ground meaning in objectivity. So I'm going to call that thing God. And then I'm going to say that my life stance should be to take a fearful position and not in the fun awe, truly fear of consequence mm. and judgment. That's why mm. judgment is always associated with it. How do we start to square perfect wisdom from God to the author of this book under the Christian pretense with what we find in the book that can be seen as almost anti-biblical or anti-Christian? Mm. Uh, yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think one thing that, um, uh, tying on the kind of wisdom theme of the book, the fact that the author is, you know, even within the book reported to be very, very wise, and obviously Solomon then extremely wise, it allows a very interesting proposition to be put forward in Ecclesiastes, which is that at various points, he alludes to the fact that his wisdom is the reason he is having this crisis, which I think is really interesting. And, you know, the end, if we if we just, you know, for, I, you know, for various reasons, I find his resolution at the end kind of unsatisfying. It'd be great if it was, because then existentialism would have been solved and we wouldn't have to think about this anymore. But yes, but, but uh, you know, if if we, if we were to say that at the end there, there is some sort of solution, then you've got this very interesting um, structure to the, the concept of an existential question, whereby, I don't know if you, you heard the expression like, a little bit of knowledge is a, is a dangerous thing, or a little bit of wisdom is a bad thing. This comes up a lot in, in various existential texts, but also it's so well reflected in Ecclesiastes. In some ways, it is better to be ignorant of the existential problem, because then you don't have to look at it. Obviously, it is, it is also good to have solved the existential problem, because then, you know, you can go on your merry way. And, and that actually, you know, as Solomon, or, or the author, cursing his own wisdom about midway through the midway through the book I find very, very interesting. It reminds me of something that um, Kierkegaard um, draws this in The Sickness Unto Death, which is his work on existential despair. He says that when you're going through a, some sort of existential challenge, you have this kind of U-shaped curve where you are you are closer to the, you're closer to being out of despair. In his view, it's complicated, but like that's at the very least out of out of the state of existential dread, just the emotional state of existential dread. And we'll leave the kind of esoteric of Kierkegaard aside. Uh, for the moment. But like, you can be closer to that solution and feel a hell of a lot worse than you did when you were further away. And I feel like that's, that, that's also a, a theme that Ecclesiastes, I think, reflects very, very well. That would be, I suppose, one potential way we could like draw something from that, I guess, would be that you've got this theme of wisdom not necessarily being a pleasant thing to have. And then it, oh, the ultimately, if you, if you, if you hold the, 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 the proposition, this was written by the wisest man who, who will ever live, and also that at the end, he didn't really solve it. I and mean, that's a really juicy thing to end on, is this idea of, oh, well, even the wisest person who has ever lived couldn't solve this issue. You drew the distinction earlier between a kind of positive and negative kind of fear, like the kind of awe-terror divide. And I could see how that would inspire awe in someone who thought that in a way that it would sort of inspire terror in me. <laughs> so so, so that I suppose that it would be a more satisfying answer if, if somebody's already... Um, already theistic. That is a really interesting standpoint to think that one would need to be of a certain belief to get either the full weight or a proper understanding. And this is, by the way, what many theists believe of of any of their holy books or holy text is, you know, <laughs> it's the thing I hear in my comments the most. Brandon, why are you talking about Paul's epistles? You don't have the witness of the Holy Spirit residing inside you. You can't possibly make sense of this, right? Like it is this gatekeeping that without a certain either actual presence of God or a healthy fear or respect of this God, I'm not able to grasp what is supposed to be grasped from his word. And, you know, not to take that lightly, like obviously I think that's a, a a bit of a joke, but when writing these things under that belief system, it is almost like you can sneak in or smuggle in some more of these theistically satisfying ends that don't work unless you are of a faith or the faith. Yeah, and I, I think I find I've stuff like that very, very interesting. Like I can so see how, if you are a theist, the fact or the idea that scripture might be incomprehensible without the intervention of the Holy Spirit would make perfect sense, right? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't. Let me push back on <laughs> you for a second, because one of the roles of scripture is supposed to be able to enlighten. It is supposed to be a word of God that is perfect truth. It is supposed to be able to correct, train, teach, and uh, I forget the fourth one. But it is always amazing to me that so many Christians are fine with hearing a testimony from from a new convert that was, someone handed me a Bible, I opened it up, and the gospel message struck me so hard, I had to believe. I thought you couldn't understand the message until you had the belief. <laughs> but you're saying you got the belief by reading the thing you can't understand without the belief. It, it, yes, it actually, yeah. I think, is a little problematic for at least the theist that tries mm. to make that case. Oh, yeah. But I mean, I, I no, do no, certainly th those saying. two points are definitely intention, yeah. right? It's, it reminds me of yeah. It's, it's I suppose it's it's when something in your in your kind of ontology or just general like map or philosophy of the world that is by its very nature incomprehensible to to our kind of petty human minds. I mean that is it's 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 very interesting for me because I I don't have that in my personal philosophy. So I like seeing what it does. Having this kind of one object in your in your philosophy mm. that is 
by its very nature, both incredibly significant and has these properties that you know it has, but also whose decision making is always going to be at least partly veiled from you. Sure, um, I and, see. You know, it reminds me, like I said, that story about St. Augustine walking on the beach and seeing the child trying to pour the ocean into the into the small hole and then going, why are you doing that? And the child turns into an angel and says, well, this is just like you trying to understand the Trinity. Like that, That's a classic example of something that makes a lot of internal sense and not a whole lot of external sense Correct. if you're not already bought into the base proposition. Yeah. yeah, I find, I mean, I find experiences like that really fascinating. Um, again, partly because I think I've, I've just never had them. So mm. I think I just find them, in, I'm inherently curious about them. Like I've got a friend who's, who's like a, a very devout Catholic. He always, he talks about this like incredible psychological experience he has when he when he takes the Eucharist or, 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 or takes communion. And I, I find that really interesting just because I'm like, oh, that when he describes the feeling, it's, I'm like, oh, I don't think I've ever felt something like that. Has there been anything secular you've ever come close to feeling like that? I mean, uh, have you ever been at a concert and been swept away in the emotion, in the course? hit just right and there's this group unity of everyone facing the same way and singing the same thing and hands in the air light your cell phones whatever like have you ever had any experience that even though you know psychologically what's going on in your mind you're saying oh this is what the people that don't understand the psychology of it attribute to the spiritual realm. Is there anything that's come close? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, uh, possibly the only thing that that I can imagine coming close is sort of very, very good evenings with friends. Mm. You're kind of sitting around and you get this kind of like incredibly warm experience in your chest that kind of radiates outwards. Yeah, just true know, I, Yeah, yeah. But again, it's again, it's, it's like again, like I said, I, I don't necessarily, I don't believe it has a spiritual origin. Obviously, my friend does. Yeah. But I still find it very, very interesting just, just because of how significant a place it holds in his life. Like I find faith as a motive very interesting. Were you ever a believer? Yeah. I mean, I've been an atheist for a very long time. Okay. I was kind of raised in like, uh, kind of like C of E Christianity, and in, which is kind of very, very gentle, come round for tea sort of Christianity. Yeah. I, think that's, um, uh, I think that's just true for the most part of European Christianity in general versus the states. When we first hopped on a call, we're talking about this because I, I was, and because you were talking about about your experience with a uh, certain sex Christianity in the states and like I I so I'm a choral singer, so I spend a lot of time in churches just working, which is you know very very good fun. And you know, I, I quite often have discussions with like Catholic bishops and, and and people like that. But when you were describing kind of some of the interactions you'd had with uh with perhaps different sectors of, of religious communities you've been enmeshed in or have encountered, it it, it, it did make me realize because I've I've never been to the states. It did make me realize the um that perhaps uh, there's a real kind of Atlantic divide on the different ways Christianity tends to be expressed. Obviously, it's yeah. you know, going to be a statistical thing or a probability thing, you know. But but yeah. how I would love to put you in my childhood church and just let you <laughs> experience Bible Belt fundamentalism at its finest. And, but it's interesting because even as I progressed out of fundamentalism, and we'll get back on track here in just a second, but with what you said, like I grew up in a kind of church that looked at communion, to go with your example, as completely about remembrance or symbolic, not mm. any true, like, you know, the Catholics take it all the way to the extreme. And then in between, when I was in high school, I started dating this girl who was a Lutheran and she had a catechism that said something totally different about communion. And she was overcome with emotion every time we had communion. And she really thought she was feeling something that you can only feel in that moment when partaking in this activity. And I begin to convince myself I was feeling it too, you know, and I can see how easy it is. And then, man, if that's all you're raised with, or if these are the ideas that you have this other thing. So yes, getting back to Ecclesiastes, when there is this undertone of a lot of this only works or makes sense when you have the belief or the presence of God dwelling in you or the law written on your heart or whichever way you want to go with it. I think that does make a great deal of sense. Getting more back on topic though, I want to hit back with you on being wise enough to know that wisdom may have hurt you. I think we see this everywhere. You mentioned it's it's here in Ecclesiastes. You know, it's in the Matrix. They talk about ignorance is bliss. You have that first scene with the traitor who is having the steak and the wine, and he's like, "Yeah, why? Why would I want to know better than this?" Right? And I think about that all the time myself as someone who deconverted and their life got harder. You know, I'm now in a marriage raising kids with a believer, but I'm not. I care about the truth enough that I was willing to deal with it, but not everybody does, and people just don't have that inclination, and then they don't have the problems. And so I'm curious to just hear you ruminate on wisdom leading to this kind of sorrow or wisdom itself being the reason for existential dread? Because I think we both, and I'll shut up in a second, have seen enough people that just don't know and they don't care. Who, who cares what we're here for? Like, I, I got to get to this thing. You know, like there are, and I'm not saying these people are stupid or worse or less intellectual or, or they're wrong, but they don't have the same care that maybe people like you and I do about thinking about these things. Yeah. No, I find, I find it very interesting. I mean, I was, I was, I was very interested. This, the smartest guy I've ever met is pure math 
physicist guy. He works on general relativity theory and he used to explain this to me and I used to not understand, but I would nod along. And I, I once asked him about existential questions, you know, I was like, oh, you ever thought about this? You know, I basically wanted to be like, can you solve this for me? Because you're a genius and I want to pick your mind. And, um, and he's, he was Greek and he just looked at me and said, Joe, Joe, why would you ask these horrible things? And I thought I thought that was just like one like it, it genuinely never occurred to. Him. Um, so yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I don't think, I don't think it's anything to do with intelligence. I think it's more to do with like temperament or something. I mean, as I said, Nietzsche views this as stemming from like a kind of psychological illness almost. He thinks that that ultimately a healthy person would not ask these questions. Do you think it's more a healthy person wouldn't ask these questions because they haven't considered them because of their health or a healthy person, and I'm, I'm kind of thinking of your Greek friend here, considered them long enough to know that there is no answer. There's not a good answer. It's going to lead to angst. It's going to lead to <laughs> sorrow. It's going to lead to confusion. So the real wisdom is is not caring, not even wanting to know, not not looking at it. Are we stuck in some middle state of stupidity where we're smart enough to know that this is an issue, but not smart enough to leave it alone? Like that's kind of how <laughs> I'm starting to to think about it. No, I I think yeah, that's a, that's a really nice way of putting it. Actually, I think I suppose there are a couple of things. Um, when when if if an existential issue is bothering you, and one of the things that you can do is run from it. And you know this is this is a, a tried and tested approach, and I think that it's it is ultimately can be a very successful approach. It then becomes an open question. Um, what happens next? I think for some people that that works out very very nicely. For others, like it just kind of like it will nag at you. I think sometimes that uh, we encounter existential issues without necessarily recognizing them as such. So I think that, you know, a midlife crisis is a really good example, actually. You know, one of, um, a, a friend of mine who's in this kind of uh, mid-50s had a, had a midlife crisis a few years ago. Um, I'd met him after that. He was talking about it. And I was like, oh, well, you know, how did it feel? And he was like, well, I, I woke up and, and none of my, my life just seemed meaningless. And I looked around at the life I've built and I thought, this is this is all for nothing. And, and I'm, I'm kind of entering the, the second half of my life now. And I was much more conscious of my own mortality. But he didn't conceive it as an existential crisis. But if you were to write that down in a, in a philosophy book or a novel, people would read it and go, oh, that person's having an existential crisis. So I think sometimes yeah. existential issues come knocking even when we've done our best to ignore them. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, even, even when we're not necessarily conceiving of them as existential issues. Like, you know, things like the problem of mortality or just like the problem of suffering. But I have like a chronic pain condition. And it's another one of the things that got me onto existential philosophy because I was just like, when I finished at university, I spent like two months just in bed in like total agony because I'd worked myself into the ground for my final exams. And I was just sat there being like, why is like, how, how do I, how do I cope with this? How do I make sense of this? And that was kind of my, one of my uh, one of things that, that got me more interested in existential philosophy. So I think that sometimes it is easier to ignore the problem in abstract than it is in concrete. I think for, while some people come at the issue from like, oh, I, I've pondered directly what I think the meaning of life is. I think that for a lot of people, it comes to them through something else. Like, you know, like waking up one day and being dissatisfied with life or not realizing why or just being in a lot of pain or like going through a divorce or something. I mean, you know, that, yeah. I think I think that, you know, I have, I have another friend who's went through a divorce a few years ago and he just had an existential crisis. You could see it happening in front of you. You know, what, what does my life look like without this person? How do, how do I make sense of life without this pin of meaning? You know, yeah. you can almost hear him say, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. What was that yeah. marriage for? It all amounted to naught. Um, mm. And I think that, that so I think that kind of general thought crops up a lot for people. And I, I do conceive of those as, ex as existential issues, even if, you know, not necessarily many people are, are want s fancy sitting down and pondering what the meaning of life is in a direct sense. No, that's a great point that it is just life that leads people, whether they have a, a term for it or not, into, into dealing with these things. And I think a lot of people that haven't thought that they've dealt with these things dealt with it maybe even and predominantly religiously right like mm. if you if you never have the chance to think to yourself what does this all mean or or nothing matters if you can't think that if you really believe just for instance in the abrahamic religions you can't it's already answered it for you you're here it's this testing ground it's this free will time to see what you will do to find out who you are to see the benefit of the good so that when you get to heaven and you're made perfect you know it is a perfecting process this is the grinder this is the refiner and that's a great answer because then all of a sudden you can just say you know this is god's will for me this is what it's all about this is why i'm here and then bam problem solved no existential crisis no awareness that this thing was even happening to you honestly i think of a conversation did you ever watch the debates uh the, there was like three in a row between peterson and and sam harris jordan peterson and sam harris no i i, I don't know so i i, I'm, I probably have but as in i i can't remember sure. them in detail if i have jordan peterson is making his case as he always does that religion is necessary, even if it's not true, which he's changed since then. Um, and the necessity of religion is to have these answers, is to be able to have this grounding. 
And Sam Harris comes back and says, it sounds to me like you're thinking people are too stupid to handle reality and they must need this. And Jordan, without missing a beat, says, yeah, they are. Most people are too stupid to be able to process and deal with what reality is. And they need this insulation that religion provides. Mm. So I'm, I'm curious if you think there's something beneficial as we talk about Ecclesiastes and religion in providing a cope, even if that's all we think it is. Is it a worthwhile cope? That argument reminds me a little bit of one that Schopenhauer made, or at least one of his characters made in a dialogue he wrote. I don't know. Maybe I, I, I don't really agree, but I only disagree on like a whim. You know, I, I don't have any evidence either way. You sure. know, I, I don't know whether, you know, isn't well, because I, I don't, I've only met a very small sample of the people that exist. And, it, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it could be perfectly, it could end up true that at scale, for whatever reason, uh, there, are, there are certain things that even if every, like, because the other thing is that it is possible that every individual person could cope, but at scale, it could not cope. Um, mm. So like that that would be another another option. Like Schopenhauer at one point, one of his like he has two a couple of distinct points, and one of them is that religion is very helpful for dealing with existential issues, and the other is that um, religion is very helpful for holding the fabric of society together. Instinctively, I want to disagree, but to a certain extent, I think that it is potentially just an unverifiable claim either way. I want to say no, but that might just be because I'm I'm just quite, I'm I'm I like I'm quite an optimistic person and I have I don't know maybe 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 this is not a good thing for an atheist to say but I ha- I have a lot of instinctive faith in people I suppose. But I also think the in- the inverse is also unjustifiable in the sense that I think the only honest answer is that I don't know because I don't think we've tried it. So interesting because that is always the clapback from a theist is okay, we get rid of God and and then what? Well, you know, like they will be the first ones to agree with Jordan Peterson to say we're not capable of of handling this reality. We don't have anything to ground our morality in. We don't have anything to ground meaning in it. And what I think they might be right for a time because we've had religion for so long. And I think this is what Nietzsche pointed to with the whole, you know, God is dead and we killed him. And then if you read the rest of what comes after that, it is this need to create because we've never been here before. Like really for most cultures and time and place, there has been a significant religious propensity to help people with this stuff. And if you do take that away suddenly, which I would think even 100, 200 years is very sudden to remove this Mm. evolutionary property that helped us Mm. function for so long, there's probably going to be a growing pain. And it might even look like things got worse. But I believe, and this is my optimism and faith that, well, If we remove this chain that keeps people in this position, perhaps once it's fully gone and there's a few generations without its stigma, we could take off and become something greater. Yeah. I mean, don't worry. I think think there are philosophical problems raised by atheism. Like I think grounding morality is 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 is, a, is you know it's a it's a good one. You've got the is ought gap. I mean, I hold the kind of cu- quite controversial position that I don't think that God actually solves the is ought gap because yeah. I think that it just introduces ought. It in- it just introduces a being that both is and ought at the start, and then you think, oh, that's fine, but that's not the is ought gap. You've just made the world inherently normative, and there's nothing that's you know there's nothing philosophically unusual about that because I you know I think that Aristotle certainly at points talks as if the world is inherently normative as the, you know the Stoics in a lot for lots of ancient philosophers nature is this kind of thick concept that rep- that is both how the world is and also in some way how the world ought to be but yeah but in, in a way that's kind of hard to get a head around in this kind of post enlightenment well post David Hume way where you where everyone's kind of you know knows what the naturalistic fallacy is and and, and we have a very is a neat is ought divide in a way that, that that philosophers didn't perhaps used to I think that a lot of the work for God grounding morality beyond kind of the is ought thing is that God provides very good reason for following morality. You know, <laughs> as, in, as in, you know, to return to this idea of God's judgment, you know, you genuinely believe that eternal torment and eternal salvation are, are on the table. That's that's pretty, that's a pretty good motivator. Like, that yeah. motivate me. It's hard to beat the carrot in the stick. It really is the yeah, end exactly. all, and, and, all. And so, so that there's that aspect to it. I'm kind of, like I say, I'm, I'm sort of on the fence on whether I think that God philosophically would ground morality. Because, um, you know, there, there, there are, you know, very ancient problems like the Euthyphro dilemma and the Isort gap is, is still there, ultimately. I just think that it's well hidden. We do kind of take it for granted that God does solve these things. That at the very least requires further philosophical argumentation. So, and, and, and some people have, right? So Tolstoy identifies these like three inherent, three things he thinks humans need to believe in um, in order to be happy, essentially. He says, you know, they need to think that there's some order in the universe. There is some reason to be benevolent to your fellow man and that there is, and that, that, that our lives matter once we are no longer living. I mean, he says, well, he, these are neatly solved by religion. And that, that's one positive argument for why, okay, that, that might be why religion hits the spot. Because it empirically seems to hit the spot for a lot of people at the very least. Yeah. Oh, I, it's, it's wonderful to have an answer, you know, and religion solves that, even if it's a bad answer. You know, this is kind of how we started. I think that what's so interesting is that we've been looking 
kind of, at Ecclesiastes. We're kind of all over the place, which I have no problem (laughs) with. We've been talking about existentialism, and I actually think most people, and maybe you can draw the line in the sand for us, when they think of Ecclesiastes and philosophy, they think of pure nihilism. Let's take a second and start at the beginning. You know, the book opens, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, thus why people think it's Solomon. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanities. And we've been saying this a lot. And that word in Hebrew, hevel, there's so many different things I've heard. I think when you and Alex talked, you guys kind of even agreed on absurd. Alex brought in meaningless, which is there. It's part of it. Vanity is probably the best translation for what it meant from the religious perspective, because it's about our ego. And then the actual Hevel word just means breath or vapor. You know, it's this evanescent property. I think with all of those attached meanings and how much depth there is and how much this is repeated, this is the theme. I think the main motif of Ecclesiastes is all is vanity. That's where a lot of people get the nihilistic idea. So what I'm going to ask you to do is maybe define as you can the slight or subtle differences from existentialism to nihilism. I know there's a lot of kinds of nihilism. There's even existential nihilism. So I'm I'm not trying to give you too hard a task, but maybe help us from your philosophical background, define those two differences, and then let's bring it back to Ecclesiastes. Nihilism, I, I mean, I think that nihilism is best understood as just devaluing something. I quite like to take a functional definition where you kind of go, okay, nihilism regarding X, saying X is meaningless or valueless or unmotivating. It's ultimately, I think, a real cluster concept. Some people say nihilism and, and, and most people recognize it as hedonism. And some people say nihilism and most people recognize it as just laying in bed. You know, and, and so, so there's a lot of different, a lot of different behaviors and beliefs that get lumped in with nihilism. I think here, it seems like, you know, all is vanity would be suggesting that in logic terms, for any X, X is meaningless. So that would be kind of, you know, at least an outward profession of total intellectual nihilism. You know, clearly he can't be a total practical nihilist because he's bothered to talk and act. There's something motivating him in practice. But at the very least, he's suggesting that the the problem posed is all is vanity. And um, in some ways, I think that, that nihilism and existentialism, I mean, existentialism, is, I think, slightly broader than this. But within the question of the kind of meaning of life, I think nihilism tends to be posed as a problem. You know, what if life is meaningless? And existentialism is, well, what should we do about it? And then, you know, beyond that, you've got um, absurdism, which is life is meaningless and we will learn to move past that. So, you know, um, I actually think Camus' analysis of, 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 like, the problem of nihilism is still, like, just absolutely top tier, where he says, you know, nihilism is is fundamentally a problem of confronting the absurd, where the absurd is the conflict between our desire for meaning and the universe's kind of refusal to cough up the goods. We want meaning, there's no meaning, what are we going to do about this? And, you know, traditionally, a lot of existential philosophy has been going, we will create meaning. I'm sure Nietzsche would hate me calling him an existential philosopher, but that is basically Nietzsche's, you know, one of Nietzsche's positions. As, you know, Sartre um, leans towards that with certain ethical constraints and and authenticity, an emphasis on authenticity and that sort of thing. What makes Camus, at least early Camus' approach very distinctive is that he takes the other route and says, well, actually, no, I think we should just stop wanting meaning. It's almost Buddhist in a way, drawing back from attachments to clinging to to the idea of meaning. I think a lot of people who read Camus or get introduced to Camus, you know, uh, maybe they just read one book and they get the, the quick version of absurdism that, hey, we don't have a good answer. And that is absurd. And that is life. And they think of it as negative. And I don't think Camus, what he's saying is inherently negative. I think it's just honest. <laughs> and it's, I, you know, to me, I think absurdism is closest to reality. I prefer Nietzsche's positive nihilism. I prefer to say, yeah, the meaning I get to make, that is the beauty of being alive. It's finite. I am an individual. I don't know how I got here or if there's a reason I got here, but I'm here And I also happen to feel these things. And maybe I can't justify all the feelings, or maybe it is as simple as evolutionary biology, but I love my kids to death. Like, it's crazy. And I take great meaning from that. And if nothing else gives me a purpose to life that I otherwise might not have, and that doesn't mean I wouldn't replace it with some other purpose. And I think we're meaning-making machines. That's what our brain does, which is why we all have these existential issues. But I think my point in saying all of this was to say, just calling a spade a spade and saying, this is absurd, is not negative. It's not nihilistic. It is maybe the first step towards something better and positive because you have to come to terms. I think that's all Camus is doing is we've got to come to grips, man. Like the universe doesn't owe you (laughs) anything. Nothing has to make sense. You don't have to have this Kant idea of morality working itself out in a later time. Like, no, like you, you might die and it might be unfair and someone might go unpunished. 
it's absurd. Yeah, I think it's it's. I've Camus. I find. I mean, I you know, I I I, sh- I should know more about it, and I don't. But um, but you know, I I having read a lot of, a lot of Camus' earlier works and Camus' later works, because later in the myth of Sisyphus, you know, Camus very very big on the kind of quantity of life over quality of life thing. You know, no distinction between types of experience. It is just experience for experience's sake. And to a certain extent, that flattens like ethics. It just kind of turns it into this kind of like nothing nothing ball. And um, you know, to the extent that one of his like absurd men is Don Juan, he's you know murderer and in some accounts just like a, a, a horrible horrible person um, depending on which version of legend you read uh, and you know that's that's one of the examples of the absurd man he gives so but then later Camus is, is much more kind of humanistic and concerned with ethics so I, I I just wonder what I wonder what changed it just seems like age don't you think I mean how how old are you oh I'm, I'm 24 yeah so you're nice and young do you think uh, and one of the things you said that was excellent I forget which video it was of yours that you were watching but you talked about how and correct me but I think you said like five years ago you didn't have any of the positions you have now and you're smart enough to know that five years from now you probably won't have many of the positions oh, yeah. I kind of hope have. I don't I feel like you know it's a, it's a good measure of oh I've probably I've probably learned a lot in the intervening years if I just kind of disagree with me now but doesn't that also mean that maybe if, if that's true for everyone and forever, which I think is an intellectually honest position to take, this idea that we're never going to arrive, I get it. And I appreciate it very much. But if that's true, does that kind of devalue truth? Like, wouldn't it be nice if there was something even by 24 you were so sure of and you knew and 10 years from now, there's nothing that would change that? Like, just mm. saying that it probably will change means you're probably wrong about whatever you're saying right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I, I think that I think that to a certain extent, you're probably right. It's the difference between like a, an induction and a meta induction, which I mm. suppose is, is the in the philosophy of science. The problem of meta induction is 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 a problem to do with how we should consider scientific theories. In a lot of ways, it's it's not talked about as much now, but it was huge in the 20th century. It was this idea of well, science is really really useful as a tool, and somebody basically said, well, well, is it true? Because we, we, it works on induction, and, and we like induction. Induction's a, a great tool. That it, it allows, you know, at the very least, whatever your position, it clearly allows us to engage with the world in a very, very useful way. If you look at the theories of science, you know, meta-inductively, in, you know, taking induction on the theories, our current theories are probably false. Yeah, and, you know, sure. and, then, and, they're, they're, and, they're, and I, you know, think a similar thing about my beliefs. I think, well, my beliefs are probably false on the basis that they've been false in the past quite a lot. And, and it's, a, it's an interesting tension because at the first order level, it's the best I've got. And at the second order level, it's probably false. So I, yeah. I, I I find that very interesting. It's it's kind of I mean I I I I enjoyed that problem because it got me onto um, researching American pragmatism, um, mm. which is this you know field of philosophy that deals with kind of the well the pragmatic side of philosophical issues. You know, it's what defines belief in terms of potential behaviors and stuff like that. And it's really Who would really good. Be fun. an American pragmatist in terms of a philosopher that is ah yeah. So it's a good a good like, so um William James like the oh the, the I love William psychologist James. is is, is yeah. he's considered an American pragmatist and in kind of like a slightly different vein. Is it different than transcendentalist then? Because I always consider James a transcendentalist. Oh God. I don't know. As in, I've only ever encountered William James through pragmatism. So I, mm. I, I sort of, I sort of, I don't know if I'm well placed to to answer that. No, but, sure. Like you know, Emerson, Thoreau. We're kind yes, of the, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, nature has this gift for us, and and we need this. Mm. It, 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 tr- the transcendentalist philosophers, I think, are the most beautiful because it it reads like poetry, even though I think a lot of it is kind of false or or <laughs> you know. And and James had a religious bend. The varieties of religious experience is one of my favorite books that I've oh, ever yeah, read. Oh yeah, yeah. And, I, mean, I, uh, I like this as lecture again. On, on uh, yeah, I don't know if it's right. On, on the meaning of life, where it talks about well, if you need religion, then believe in religion. Like it's, yeah. it's, again, it's 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 so it's so wonderfully William James, like I just, <laughs> just kind of you know so grounded in the pragmatism of the issue. I was just thinking that 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 point you were talking about in terms of changing beliefs over time and that leading to a sort of meta lack of confidence in your in your beliefs at any given time. Yeah, it actually reminds me of something. You know, that you'd said something there which I thought was very interesting. And also ties back with Ecclesiastes about the comforting maybe comfort isn't the right word. Uh, the the grounding nature of something moving inexorably towards an end. So in Ecclesiastes, something that I notice in, in Ecclesiastes, the structure of the book is is cyclical. But also he talks about cycles. You know, he talks about, yeah. oh, well, you know, the sun rises and then the sun sets and then nothing changes and it all happens over and over again. Everything that's happening now happened in the past and everything that will happen has happened in the past. And, you know, there, then there's nothing new under the sun. Again, it just uh, ties in with what, with what you were just saying. One of the things that heaven does existentially and, and, and hell does existentially, just in a less pleasant way, is, is bring 
existence to a timeless end mm. you know and it's, it's something that it's something that nietzsche picks up on again with his idea of eternal recurrence you know this kind yeah. of earlier thought experiment and later turned into a metaphysical doctrine in uh, you know presented in its more kind of thought experimenty form and this idea of okay well imagine that you were to live your entire life over and over again you know that there's just, just every day now will come back round again for eternity how does that make you feel and he says you know that's a reasonably good gauge of where you are existentially you know if you're if you if you go ah oh, that sounds like an absolute nightmare that tells you something really valuable and if you go oh fantastic i'll get to live today again i love today uh, my entire life is is you know his idea of well if you feel like your entire life is already infused with meaning in this kind of natural almost unconscious way that he thinks people with well organized wills will see their lives he says that well you'll know that because you'll think eternal recurrence sign me up and you know you'll know that you have a disorganized will if you think eternal recurrence car that completely takes the wind out of my sails it's funny because i know that that's his position to essentially judge negatively the people that would not be in favor of eternal recurrence but i've always been terrified of it from the first time that i ran across <laughs> that proposition and i didn't like what that was necessarily saying about me and who am i to argue with nietzsche but at the same time it is oh, no, just, I, I, uh, please do argue with nietzsche because he does like i don't well just because i i also think that uh, because nietzsche is one of the few philosophers that are like really filtered into really filter into like public discourse like people will just say oh well nietzsche said this on like a, a like a public program like you occasionally see it on tv shows in the uk somebody be like a sat at one of those kind of new shows and I go oh well Nietzsche said this and I think okay yeah that doesn't actually mean he's right like sure, Nietzsche said yes. loads of things yeah he said a lot and not all of it works together but still you know it's funny because a lot of people view Nietzsche as like a fad for people that become interested in philosophy you know I don't know if you've ran into this especially being in the academic world but in the non-academic world as I would talk to friends and whatever about oh I'm just you know I'm 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 reading the uh, the gay science right now and it says this and I'm I'm blown away at this idea and they're like yeah you, you'll get past that after Nietzsche you'll move on and you know they they kind of give you this and I I always thought like yeah he's not right about everything but just to sum him up as a quick fad for an underdeveloped philosophy like no, you don't get to oh, do no, this. Yeah, exactly. I think he's he's a, he's a he's a, a serious thinker. I mean, I like him because he's. I was in well, like him is probably too strong of a word. I like a lot of his thoughts because I feel like he's a a philosopher that takes atheism seriously. Mm, you know, he's, he's he kind of says, okay, well, we've got atheism. Here are a few problems I think arise from that. But he also doesn't suggest, oh, well, this means atheism is, atheism is untenable. He's like, well, how are we going to fix them? And I think yeah. that, you know, regardless of the rest of the stuff he says, I think that's a really nice thought. Like you, I'm pretty darn positive, all things considered, even though, you know, the view of atheists is we're all angry and nihilistic <laughs> and nothing matters. I think a lot matters. A lot matters to me personally, and I'm very happy and I'm very content. But I would never want to do this all over. Oh my gosh, I wouldn't want to do it all over. And I don't know what that says about me. Maybe I am disordered in some way, but no, no, I, I, it doesn't I think, seem to jive. No, but it's, it's, I think that it, there's no getting around the fact that it's quite unpleasant to go through an existential crisis. It's not like, it's yeah. not fun. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. One of the one of the responses that I, I get a lot when I talk about existential philosophy is like, oh, this is a luxury issue. You know, a lot of people say, oh, it's not a luxury issue. And I actually disagree. I think it is a luxury issue in a lot of ways. I if think you're so like, it, I, you know, my, my cast sample is, if you're starving, you will be too busy finding food to go through an existential crisis. It's not going to yeah. happen. And again, to draw us back to Ecclesiastes, you know, he's saying, I've got all these, I've got wealth beyond my wildest dreams. I am, I'm the incredibly wise. I've got all this stuff. I couldn't have more power or riches. And yet I feel this way. And I think that, you know, sure, you can look at that and say, oh, that's a luxury issue. But the fact that it's a luxury issue makes it more scary because the idea that you could achieve everything that you'd ever wanted and at the same time, just be like totally miserable about it. It not only suggests that happiness might just be permanently beyond the grasp of humanity, which is, you know, to a certain extent, Schopenhauer's, well, it's almost Schopenhauer's position i mean he's he's slightly more optimistic than that despite him being a pessimist uh, you know but but this idea that okay we'll, we'll just start grasping after more and more stuff until until we die and satisfaction will forever elude us that's part of the the proposition raised by an existential crisis especially for someone like solomon working on the assumption that this is solomon writing sure, at the very yeah. least he says he's got riches and everything that he could ever want and at the same time he's deeply unhappy um, and the way because that he also positions what, that is uh, sorry to cut you off um but just for the the listeners the way that he positions that is almost like an experiment that he did on himself where he gave himself a season of life to say yes to everything to have everything to be as hedonistic as one could be which is a great excuse for all of Solomon's shortcomings biblically speaking you know he had more wives i think than anyone else in the bible so yeah he definitely <laughs> had his time of of hedonism and was reported to be the richest man you know even today they've done fun studies where they talk about how much gold was in Solomon's temple from certain descriptions and they mm. tried to inflate that and compare it to today's billionaires and like Solomon comes out so far above you know <laughs> Buffett and Gates and everyone else like 
he really is this pinnacle, which is what makes it such good lore storytelling you have. And, and we hear this in today's society. You know, none of our celebrities are happy. Like why, why do these celebrities that have everything, the fame, the riches, the yeah, yeah, yeah. respect, you know, kill themselves or why are they mm. miserable? And Solomon is here answering that, I think, in, in the passage that you're bringing up. And it is almost this refutation of, I think, hedonism to his point of, hey, I tried it, guys, and look, it doesn't work. And that's how I know. And then he, you know, gets to the conclusion yes, at the yeah, end of the yeah. book. Right. And so, yeah, what are your, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree. I think, I think it's funny to pick up on the celebrity point because I, I, I think that, um, you know, our standard response to like celebrities, oh, well, maybe not our standard response, but like one of the responses you see a lot when um, celebrities are going through like a really hard time or, or somebody very, very rich are going through a very hard time is people will say, oh, well, you know, I don't know what they're complaining about. And like, I really empathize with that reaction. I think we all have that urge sometimes. Like occasionally I see something on the news and I'm like, oh, come on, man. You're like, like you're Brad Pitt. Just be happy. Do you know how happy I would be if I was Brad Pitt? And then, but then the other part of me is like, well, no, okay, I must be missing something because I believe that they are unhappy. Um, they, whoever I don't know if Brad Pitt's very unhappy. It's just a hypothetical example. But like, you know, whoever this is, I clearly believe that. You know, I, I'm, I'm not doubting that they are unhappy. What I'm suggesting is, oh, I would be happier than that in their position. And then I think, yeah, but do I know that? You know, they've got all that stuff, um, and it hasn't made them happy. I think in some ways this this could this passage can provoke a similar reaction, right? It's like, on the one hand, you think, well, you've, you you're allowing yourself everything you ever wanted. Why aren't you happy? And then the flip side of that is, wow, you're allowing yourself everything you ever wanted. Why aren't you happy? Like, if I was in that position, would I also not be happy? And I think that the, I think the trouble is, you know, to tie back to this, this theme of nihilism and broken promises. And that broken promises thing is something I got from, oh, I've forgotten his name. Um, he's got the same name as a, as a US talk show host. John Stewart. Um, John Stewart. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, his, his analysis of nihilism, just to kind of contextualize that, because it's not an original observation. The, the broken promises aspect of nihilism is that this is this is a real broken promise. That idea of, well, one day you'll be happy. The, the reason that I think that uh, hedonism not making us happy can be quite a terrifying thing is because you think, what, what will make us happy then? You know, if endless riches and material success and all of that won't make us happy, what will make us happy? And I, the reason I, one of the things that's great about Ecclesiastes is at the end, it's not even clear that he says fearing God and doing your divine duty will make you happy. It, it's almost like oh, yeah. you get to the end. It's like, well, that's all there is to do. So. Exactly. It is not a. It is not a prescription of joy. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> he didn't solve the problem with fearing and obeying. He said, in lieu of everything else, like this is what's left. This is reality. And I, I do think. See, when I hate Ecclesiastes, it is because I see it as an apologetic. You know, it, and I didn't see it like that when I was a Christian. When I saw it as a Christian, I thought, oh, look at this. Look at this beautiful philosophy that that points to God. Mm. But the more times I've read it as an atheist, and even like the example I just gave of, have you ever dealt with a, a theist that says something to the effect of, oh yeah, I used to be an atheist and hate God. And, and you know, they're trying to give you like this big script of, well, when I was like you, I was just doing it because I was angry and I wanted to sin. And, and they're, it's probably not true. Like maybe they were never an atheist. And also if you hate God, you're definitely not an atheist. So like, that's how I know they're probably like giving me a story to try to support their position. And even though if this was written by Solomon, his story is true. This quick excerpt of, I gave it a season. I lived in sin and look, it didn't work. Like that to me is a Christian apologetic. And then you mix it with the end of, so all that there is to do is obey God. And it's like, oh, you're just preaching. Like this isn't some grand philosophical musing. You you tricked me. <laughs> this is like yeah. what the theist does when they concoct a, a fake atheism testimonial to, to take it down. And I'm reaching. I don't actually fundamentally believe that about the book of Ecclesiastes, but oftentimes it comes out that way to me, which is what I talked about at the beginning. There's so many perspectives that one can take from this book. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's, that's really interesting. I suppose it's one thing, like, I do think that, you know, Solomon's idea of, of hedonism not working. I mean, I, I do think that that's, I mean, maybe it's just because, you know, I, I'm not like naturally hedonistic by nature, but I, I do think broadly that's true. I think it's true too. I just don't think it's true for the reason that theists dispose, which is that nothing can mm. make one content except God, you know, because we do see, you've probably heard those studies, everyone says money can't buy happiness. And then there was a study, I forget which one it was, that came out and they said, well, it can to a degree. And at that time, it gave a precise figure, $73,000 salary yeah, yeah. 
Anything above that had limiting returns and eventually diminishing returns, right? And anything before that, you're in such need that, yeah, you don't, yes, yeah, yeah. you can't be. And so I completely agree that excess in general, if we're just painting with a broad brush, yeah, it's not going to always be what we make it out to be in our mind because when you're in need, excess is the solution. But when you're content, excess can be devastating. That's a very stoic idea, right? And so- I, I agree. I just uh, sometimes I get more hung up on motive and method than I should. No, no, it's absolutely. It's interesting. I, I find the I find the kind of hate God thing really interesting. Camus talks about like the metaphysical rebellion of of hating God and and defines it as, as kind of a theistic position, right? Because as an atheist, you kind of can't hate God, right? Because you can't hate something that you don't think exists. I don't believe that the Green Goblin from Spider Man exists, and I, so I can't hate him. Like I can hate a fictional representation of him within the logic of that fiction. But if you were like, "Oh, do you hate the Green Goblin?" I'd be like, "Not really." You know, I, I don't. I don't. I I could only ever hate him in this kind of metaphorical, pseudo fictional sense. Although the the, what, the only thing that I, I I potentially might say with the kind of "Ah, oh, you just hate God" thing. So I suppose the flip side of that, I do think there's a there's a kernel of truth in that, which is when I talk. So I, you know, I, I, I as I say, I spend a lot of time in churches. So I. I quite often talk to people and I say, why do you believe in God? And I do think that for a lot of people, it is, you know, partly an emotional thing. Like, I don't, I like, it's very rare. I've met like two people who were like, oh yeah, I read, I read Summa Theologica ah, and I was right. convinced by the, by, by the first way. I was just like, you know, there must be a prime mover. And like, I think that's great. Like that, that's awesome, right? I, I mean, I don't personally find the argument persuasive, but I love that somebody just kind of went and, and, and was, you know, totally swayed by the Aristotelian metaphysics and thought, yeah, no, this is my thing. But the majority of people, it is it is partly emotionally driven. And, you know, I don't think that this is a uniquely theistic thing. I think that quite a lot of our of our beliefs are, are going to be partly emotionally driven. Oh, yeah. Um, you studied logic I, and you have to know nobody, no matter how smart or intellectual you are, <laughs> really... I mean, I, none of my opinions are going to be purely logical. Yeah, I mean, like, I think they are from my limited sure? first person perspective. But again, from that meta view, I know that there are going to be like unconscious things that I'm, I'm not aware of that will be driving why I looked at a particular piece of information rather than another piece of information. I wonder if that that that's kind of position. Oh, you must be an atheist because you hate God. It's partly because I know a lot of I know a lot of people who are theists partly because they love God, and, and that and that's a real kind of anchor mm. of their faith. Yeah, I know, but yeah, I know. Sorry, that just that's kind of a no. Elaborate. You're fine. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's um, it's obviously an unfair thing to say about atheists, but I think it is bec- like what you're alluding to here is the theist is so ingrained in God being the center that to disagree with them is not to remove God, it's to hate God because they love God and you're doing the opposite. And so like without thinking all the way through it, I I can get why someone can be like, oh, well, you must be really mad at God. Like who hurt you kind of a deal. All these stupid things that atheists get thrown at them all the time that I, I truly understand where people are coming from. The other thing that I think I think is very interesting about, as I'm, again, I was again having a conversation with a priest the other day, and he he was you know, he's, he's not like kind of he's not like he doesn't hate atheists or anything. But I remember he said that he once got offended during a debate with an atheist. The atheist hadn't necessarily said anything offensive. And he wasn't suggesting that they had. He just said, you know, he just he just described this feeling of being like, oh no, I feel like I'm hurt by that and I don't know why. Something that he said that I that really kind of opened my kind of empathetic doors in a way that that that, that hadn't been before was that uh he's he, you know, he's he's a Catholic priest, so he's celibate. But he said it was like somebody said they didn't believe in my wife. And I thought that that was just I thought that was a that was just a, a, an interesting way of putting it. And again, just kind of made me think, oh yeah, actually I, I can see how the extra agential component of the belief might cause somebody to take more offense at something like that. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that, you know, I, I've never, I, on the whole, I, I don't find that theists generally get offended at me. So it's not, sure. but it just, it just reminded me of it, tying into what you're saying. About yeah. That. You know, I mean, my two best friends who are not philosophically minded and are absolute true believers, they are offended by my very position. It doesn't matter how sound it is. It doesn't matter how compassionate I am. I simply am not for, and this is the danger of religious indoctrination, because even the Bible states, if you're not for us, you're against us, right? Like it is very in group, out group. That is a, that is quite the statement. And by the very nature that I'm not for this God and his will, and that I don't see his love or grace, I am against. And, and they have a really hard time squaring that with me. Uh, Aside from how I treat them and how much I love them and I love their families and I take care of their kids, like it doesn't matter. 
there is this divide. It's something built into the religion, and it's also emotionally true. I The wife example is perfect. I was thinking it myself in my head when you brought it up, like, yeah, I would take offense, even if someone had no reason or I thought they were completely wrong, if they just denied like the existence or the beauty or the love of my wife, like I'd be like, screw you. Like, what do you know? You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's, and I, I found it very interesting. Again, it was like, it was like, oh yeah, God. You know, you know, and you just kind of have a, oh yeah, I, I, I didn't understand that before. Now I actually kind of get it. It just made me kind of think a bit more, think a bit more deeply about it. Because I was like, yeah, okay, actually, you know, if you believe in a, in a person and somebody denies that person. And also, you know, I, I was thinking about some of my friends have like, you know, really, really deep personal relationships with what they think is, is God. And obviously I disagree, but I was like, yeah, actually, you know, you've got a lot hanging on that. Like I can understand why you have a lot of investment here. Yes. I, I think that's, yeah. It's, it's very fair. The, uh, but yeah, again, uh, bring it back to, um, to Ecclesiastes. The hedonistic uh, observation, I think, is one of these cycles that he goes through where he says, you know, and, and also wisdom doesn't amount to anything. And then paradoxically, it's better to be wise than foolish. But, you know, wisdom ultimately doesn't amount to anything because that too is meaningless and that, um, that, that toil also amounts to nothing. And I, I want to draw upon the kind of problem of evil stuff later in the text as well because I, I i the problem i i, you know, I find the problem you very fascinating anyway but i also think that in ecclesiastes it's approached from this existential direction that i find very interesting because i in some ways the problem of evil is a variant on this whole host of philosophical problems that comes about from just the existence or the the the, the postulation of there being a moral or normative way that the world should be and the conflict that that comes in with the way that the world is which is not that. And, you know, it reminds me of it. I always think back to, you know, in Plato's, um, the beginning of Plato's Republic, they haven't, you know, they haven't talked about God yet. Yet the first question, you know, when they, when they ask what is justice, one of the first things they say is, well, why should you be just? You know, just people get screwed over all the time. Like, like why, why, why should we bother with this whole justice thing? It seems, it seems kind of useless. And, you know, and I, I, I kind of think of the, the other variants of that, like, like, um, like the kind of personal problem of suffering, like Boethius in The Consolation mm. of Philosophy. One of my favorites. It's, it's, yeah, his issue is just as much injustice has been done to me as a bare fact, as it is injustice has been done to me under the guise of, a, of, a, of an omniscient, mm. omnipotent, and omnibenevolent God. It's interesting. Yeah, and I, and I think in Ecclesiastes, the kind of problem of evil or problem of suffering is, is approached in a very particularly rich way because it has this existential component in it as well, which which perseveres well beyond abandoning the existence of, uh, of God. You know, that, that, that person is just in life, you know, as in people, it doesn't, whatever somebody's philosophical persuasion is, if something really bad happens to me, you know, a loved one dies, well, most people that I have come across will ask why. And so I, I think that Ecclesiastes really brings that aspect into, into the fore, because I, partly because I think that sometimes, you know, as an atheist, I sometimes feel like I, I trick myself to thinking that I'm off the hook with the problem of evil. And I say, well, you know, there's no logical contradiction. I'm like, okay, yeah, but like the logical contradiction only really mattered because we care about suffering itself and we care about evil itself. That in itself poses a problem problem to our peace of mind yeah. um, beyond any kind of um, logical conflict with theism. It is an interesting answer or attempt yeah, at the problem of suffering or evil. But at the same time, like if I were trying to be a jerk atheist in a debate and using Ecclesiastes, right, I would use it to point to the fact of the hypocrisy of the rest of the canon or the religion. There's like a few different ways that I that I can see this in my head. I'll see if I can get any of it out. But like in what you were just saying about when a loved one dies, something so bad, we think it's so bad because we feel that loss. We remember what it's like to have them. We have a connection. We love them and then we'll miss them. But if you're a believer... It gets more complicated. And I think that this is true. And I think that this plays itself out in a few different ways uh, in Ecclesiastes. So I'm going to try to tie it in. But like, if you're a believer and you really believe that this life is, bam, a snap, a blink of an eye compared to eternity, and that eternity will be perfect, and that there's suffering here, and that your loved one was suffering, in what world do you pray that they stay alive? You know, maybe your, your significant other is sick. And they've got cancer. And you pray, you organize prayer teams, you have people come in and lay hands on the sick, you wrestle with this, you you desire so badly for them to be, but there's a part of me, and I, I would never go as far as to say, oh, they must not really believe it. But if you really believed truly to your soul that if they died, everything would be perfect for them and you'll be with them in the blink of an eye and then you'll both be there forever— how could you pray that God would keep them alive to continue to suffer? How could you pray for your cure? And I just think it's a dissonance. I think it's this disconnect. And I think Ecclesiastes shows it a lot, like with the wisdom thing. You know, there's a other verse where Solomon is saying, above all else, get wisdom. That is the decree. Above all else, get wisdom. And then wisdom is meaningless in the next book, you know? And again, if you're a believer, who cares about wisdom? 
be dumb, be stupid, get tread on by other people, get taken advantage of. It should just strictly be about preaching the gospel and hoping you die, like Paul. That's what Paul said. To me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That is what I think someone who properly believes or who has brought those beliefs into their you know, outward extrinsic actions, the only logical end. But we don't see anything like that in reality, and we specifically don't see anything like that in Ecclesiastes. We see almost it to its exact opposite end. Because in Ecclesiastes, he says, eat the bread, drink the wine, enjoy, because there's nothing else and everything sucks. So if you can get yourself some good, get it, which is, again, a night and day difference. Especially because I, I, there's another point where he says, um, was it, it's, it's better to die than to live and better to have never been born than to have than yeah. to, to have come into existence. Which again, is something that Schopenhauer says. There's lovely parallels, but um, yeah, that almost kind of anti-life position. Again, it, it makes sense if, if you think that, you know, if, if, if he's struggling with this all is vanity thing. It reminds me of what you just said, reminds me of a, a story that I, I, I've been told by my parents from when I was like seven in some, I you know, used to go to Sunday school. The priest was talking about heaven and, and baptism and the idea that, okay, well, when you're baptized, you're you're like clean of sin and you're, you go straight to heaven if you die right then and i was like well that's great man but like why didn't you kill me then mm. and like you know it's, it's kind of in that kind of like innocently childlike sure. way of asking where i was just like i kind of like heaven sounds really great and hell sounds really awful really wish you would have done me in then yep and then i could have been assured to go to heaven and and instead of you taking the chance later down the line that felt like a, a bit of a gamble it is a gamble it's the greatest gamble on earth and actually it's one that caused me i was I was in a very unique position theologically and in my personal relationship with God at the time that we had our first kid. It was shortly after the birth of my son where I felt this desire to like stop making excuses and really like figure out why I believed what I believed before I passed it on. And that's what led to my ultimate deconversion. But before then, I did kind of wrestle with this idea. You know, it's it's almost a Calvinist idea of I was in between Calvinism and 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 traditional Protestantism. I'll just highlight this super quickly. The Calvinists believe in predestination. They believe in the elect. And if you really believed that, well, having any kids at all is the world's biggest gamble. And if you believe that the way is narrow and there's only a certain number of elect, every time you have another kid, you're essentially up in the chances that one of them will burn in hell forever. Like this is what they believe. And yet they are usually the families I know of anecdotally that have the most children. And so again, kind of this dissonance between like, you really believe that some of your children won't be elect, but you're willing to play the odds in the wrong way. And, and same thing, you know, people make this argument a lot about the age of accountability, where everyone is innocent until a certain age. And that age is defined differently by different religions. The earliest, I believe, is seven and the oldest is 12. And then some people just say it's somewhere in between based off your personal development. But if you really believe that, like, don't let kids get over seven. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> It's mm. nothing could matter more than eternity. 70 years, it doesn't matter how immoral it would seem. Everyone should be killing their kid. Like that yeah, is there's unfortunately, this kind of prima facie tension there. Yeah. And so again, I think, oh, I'm going to try to hold our our feet to the fire for Ecclesiastes and stop getting off on tangents. Oh, no, no, but, no, but I totally got, but I think I think it actually ties in quite nicely with Ecclesiastes because you've got like loads of loads of these these tensions are evidence in Ecclesiastes, right? Because you've got this kind of again, you've got the eat, drink, and be merry, and everything is everything is 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 meaningless. And also, there there are points where it seems like like right at the end when he talks about youth, I always think that's that's very interesting because I can't you know I can't work out whether he's saying um, that youth is just good because you haven't noticed that life is meaningless yet. I think you're right. Um, which I, I think is you know that's that, that, that's, that's kind of a I've been thinking about you know the existential problems as, as like basilisks recently. So this idea of you know like the, the in mythology, the basilisk kills by looking. But you know, when you look it in the eye, it kills you. Mm -hmm. And um, and you know, mm. the, this kind of there almost seems to be that sort of theme running through here, where it's like, well, you know, you've got to you've got to enjoy your life before this question hits you in an emotional way. Because I do think that people can intellectually deal with nihilism without it really hitting them hard. I find that very very interesting because partly because you know, ending on that note, it's it's one of the like it's one of the last things he says before the kind of scribe takes back over. Ending on the idea of um, you know. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth and the idea that, you know, as you age, things will inevitably get much, much worse. I mean, that's that's very interesting. It, like I said, it almost, it almost ties into this theme of, well, the, the the only way to win the game is to not sit down at the table. Yes, you know, don't, exactly. Don't, don't get, once you've got to the vanity, vanity, all is vanity stage, you are you are so far 
gone. It is far too late now. And again, you you see similar themes crop up in in, in like nineteenth twentieth century philosophy. Like like I said, Nietzsche is again this idea of well, if you're already asking the question, something something's already gone wrong much much farther back. And Camus saying, you know, once you look at the absurd, you kind of can't run from it anymore. It's there. You've encountered it. You've you've got to do you've got to deal with it in some way. And almost you know Kierkegaard saying that well, once you're once you're conscious of despair, the only way out is through. So what does through look like? If you're going through hell, just keep going, right? Like this is the thing. The only way out is through. I, I understand the the idiom, but I'm saying like from a metaphorical perspective, is the end to die? So you're not in this anymore. Is the end to solve it? Is the end to just accept and embrace the struggle? Like what do you think from Ecclesiastes is the prescription? To what through is. Yeah. I mean, I suppose, you know, obviously you've got the, the thing about uh, fearing God and following his commandments, but also, yeah, but you've also got lots of other, you know, there, there are lots of these micro answers, like enjoy your youth is one, you know, that's a, that's a kind of, that's a micro answer. Well, I thought of something when you said that actually, and I hadn't thought of it before. So thank you for eliciting something new. You've done that many times already. But when you said, is it just because you'll become aware eventually? I actually also think based off the verses it's because once you become aware, you become responsible. And I think that we see this in like general life. Like everyone tells your kids, like, don't grow up too fast, man. Like I remember I was so gung ho to get a job. I got my first job at 14. And then I was always working like two or three jobs, even during school. And all my friends' parents were like, dude, you don't need to grow up so fast. Like, don't, don't do this. You don't know what you have right now. You know, youth, mm. you know, uh, freedom. And with the expiration of that comes responsibility. And I think in this case, it's a greater responsibility to obey God, thus mm. the end verses. Mm. But it is kind of this weird concession from God, which you know modern day Protestants would not be on board with of, at some point in your life, you're going to have to get right with me. But you know what? There is kind of this time of revelry uh, in your youth where wink, wink, have fun, you know, scrape your knees, break the rules, drink a little too much, you know, and, but hey, enjoy it because it's going to come to a crash and end. And then you're going to owe me. There's judgment, there's pain, you're going to have to change. But it does seem like an allowance from God via Solomon speaking on his behalf of what is right that we don't see elsewhere with all the, you know, the rest of the Old Testament is 600, the Torah, 613 laws, very specific laws that are anything but eat, drink, and be merry, you know? And then we just get this juxtaposition with supposedly the greatest work of wisdom literature of all time. And I, I really can't make sense of it theologically. It's one of those things, yeah, it reminds me a bit of, um, you know, the in Augustine's Confessions where he says, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. Yeah. I, I yes, just love perfect. that line. I mean, partly because it's just so, it's such a like a wonderfully relatable thought. And this idea of, oh, well, you know, I know I should do something, but like just another day, like another day of eat, drink and be merry. Yeah. So yeah, I think we did arrive there. All right. I'm going to back into some other Ecclesiastes points. I think we've covered vanity of life. One of the things that I'd like to cover with you is the pursuit of wisdom and knowledge. We talked about the get wisdom. We talked about the counterpoint of wisdom leads to this awareness, which leads to the responsibility. But from Ecclesiastes, what kind of wisdom and how often and when, like what is our responsibility to knowledge? Yeah. I mean, it's, again, it's, 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 it's this, because he introduces this, this hierarchy of, of kind of wisdom and wisdom is better than foolishness, but they're all, they ultimately both get overtaken by vanity or, or, or by, by meaninglessness. When I first read it, I, I, I thought about whether this is a, a sort of internal hierarchy and then the entire hierarchy gets thrown out. This kind of, well, you know, wisdom is better than foolishness, but ultimately, no, it's not. They both amount to nothing. Eventually, meaninglessness overtakes them both. And eventually, you both end up in the ground. So, like, what's the point? As I say, it's it's so difficult to square with the the, the proverbs, you know, the only thing, you know, the, the highest thing to pursue is wisdom. And indeed, the kind of philosophical wisdom tradition of, of, of um, you know, uh, you know, Plato saying, you know, contemplating the form of the good is, is, is the highest thing a human can do. And then Aristotle talking about different types of wisdom. You know, wisdom holds even today, even though it's kind of an archaic word, I suppose, you know, we do, it's not like we hear wisdom thrown around in our everyday lives, but it still holds such a place of reverence in our cultural consciousness. And as a result, you know, Solomon's critique of wisdom can hit particularly hard because I think that a lot of people are reasonably, like a lot of people, if, even if we don't always act like it, like I don't always act like it, but if you were to sit me down and say, Joe, do you think hedonism is a good way to live your life? I would say no. And then I would go to the pub. But like, in the moment, I would say no. But whereas I think that a lot of people wouldn't say the same thing about wisdom. You know, they're, they're, a lot of people are much more willing to go, well, no, wisdom, like wisdom, wisdom, learning and a, a crafting an approach to life. That seems like it's it's worthwhile. That seems like it could it could it could outrun vanity. It's like a universal acceptance of a good. It's like a it's an actual, you know, who did I hear? Oh, it was it was your buddy 
Alex O'Connor. Uh, he was he was talking about with destiny. He was talking about principle. How how we give this credit to oh well you're principled. Uh, you know I don't agree with you, but I respect that you're you're sticking by what you believe. And like no you don't. If someone was a KKK member, like you don't respect their belief or the fact that they stand by it. But yet we do have this idea that to be principled, and in the same way I think we have this idea that to seek wisdom or try to become wise, or, you know, this is even why all cultures throughout history respected elders, because there was an idea that if you live that long, you knew something someone else didn't. We've lost that now because we can replace, you know, survival of the fittest essentially with modern medicine and and group and all of this. But historically, to be old meant to be wise because you had to know something to survive long enough to become Mm. an elder. The problem is, is you can get old now being completely stupid or wrong where you couldn't used to. So like... yeah, it's funny. I had this conversation with my dad because he was complaining that kids today don't respect their elders in the same way that they used to. And I said, well, our elders today is wise and useful as they used to be. And I don't know. It's a quip. I haven't thought it through. I don't know the data. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, no. So I'm just ultimately, saying, like, it's not like every, it's not like age necessarily grants wisdom. For sure. It's just, yeah. But it can provide it's, for it's, it, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think that, I suppose it's like, yeah, I don't know how, how I quite approach it. I probably, I suppose it's one of those um, heuristical markers that probably makes me pause for thought. Like, you know how, um, you know, there are certain things where if somebody says something to you and it seems like it's nonsense like if it if you know if it's just a if it's like a, a, a somebody tweets something at you and you think oh well that's nonsense and i'm not going to reconsider whether that's nonsense that just seems like it's nonsense and and i have no reason to think that it wouldn't be if i gave it further reflection and i, I suppose maybe it's just that maybe maybe it is just that kind of second order level oh well this seems like i disagree with this but maybe there's something in it so like, I, I think about this a lot with a lot with biblical texts actually because obviously i'm an atheist so I, I don't believe it's true and this is something i've become increasingly careful about just uh, partly just because I, I I feel like I missed just like so much before I I, st- I started doing this a lot and that kind of like uh, try, trying to apply as extreme a principle of charity as I can not necessarily in order to, for, for the sake of accuracy more for the sake of like well if there's something in this I really want to know what it is because you know that that's that's kind of useful to me at least but um so let me yeah. ask you this then on the topic of uh, why we're still here on wisdom, which one comment I want to make, and then I have a question for you is, I think, you know, if you go back to the original story of Solomon, who is our supposed author here, you know, he gets the genie wish from God, what do you want? And I'll give you anything. And when he chooses correctly, which is what God tells him, oh, you asked for wisdom over these other things you've chosen correctly. And I forget what it is, but then he blesses him with something else that supposedly he wouldn't have blessed him with if he had chosen Herculean strength, right? And so even by God's own admission, so the story goes in the lore, wisdom was the highest thing to work towards. And then the wisest person, once they receive the greatest wisdom from the creator of wisdom and all things, says wisdom is useless. And so it's like, what the hell? But (laughs) I guess, you know, aside from that, my question to you would be, from the book of Ecclesiastes, even as an atheist, pulling out what you can, what are your best takeaways? Give me like the Joe one, two, three. This is what is inherently true or useful from Ecclesiastes. The wisdom point is one of them, just because I think that it is it is a it is a challenge that goes far beyond what we normally think of as the hevel ways of engaging with life. You know, I said, most people will be like, oh, well, yeah, no, I get that money ultimately won't make you happy beyond a certain point and that hedonism is is kind of a doomed quest eventually. But but like, yeah, most people hang on to wisdom as, as something that is is worth pursuing uh, almost in and of itself. So I think that is a critique, I, I think is, I think is really interesting just for raising the question. I think that the, I think that the cycles is another point where I, I again, I think at least it raises the question of what is the existential import of convergence and endings in our in our philosophies? Everything that is has happened before, and everything that will be has happened before. And there's this idea that okay, well, there's there is nothing new because it's all happened in one thought through God. And I, I think you know because I, I think again, it's 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 a, it's an unusual existential challenge. It raises the question of whether it's important for life's normative arrow to have a target that it will eventually hit. Do we find cyclical structures inherently unsatisfying? Because you know, it's it's another way of um, that imagine Sisyphus happy. Even to that is a, is a cyclical structure, right? That that Sisyphus rolls the bottle up the hill, it goes back down again. He does the same thing over and over again. And Dostoevsky talks about how he thinks somebody would go insane if you just gave them two glasses of water and said just transfer water from one glass to the other for no reason. He says if you made somebody do that for for, for a few hours, they would just chew the wallpaper. And I think you know, and I, and I think within this is this idea of well, where does it end? And I think that that again highlights an often underrepresented factor of these 
underlying potentially like human philosophical, I wouldn't need is too strong of a word, but inclinations towards believing certain things. Us crying out for a definite end, you know, like a timeless state, something beyond. It's raising an aspect of existential challenges that I think often goes overlooked because, you know, we're focused on kind of mortality or, or the emptiness of pleasure or something like that. And I think that idea of an end point, partly because of how intention it is with the idea of mortality, because mortality is an end point. So the, the interplay between those two factors, I think, is very, very interesting, because on the one hand, mortality guarantees an end point, And on the other hand, this kind of cyclical structure deprives you of an end point. And that, to me, suggests that, you know, if you're trying to resolve that tension, um, the thing that that Solomon seems to be after is a normative endpoint. You know, something something that he is something that is he is normatively striving towards uh, a state that ought to be. Again, I find that very interesting. And yeah, and the other thing is at the end, this fear God and obey His commandments. The fact that that is not presented as a massively joyful response just highlights another another aspect of existential issues that I don't think that we often give enough time of day to, which is. We tend to go with, well, God would solve an existential problem. And I think that at the end, you kind of get this, well, you've got God. Because when I read, and it might be very different, like if, if I was, if it was a devout Christian reading it, maybe they get to the end and they'd be like, oh yeah, that we've had the tension and that's the release. You know, that's the kind of musical resolution to this, to this book. But for me, I get to the end and I'm like, oh great, well now he's got God, but he doesn't seem that happy about it. And how, how exactly has that helped? It's done something for evil because you've got God's just judgment will sort it out eventually. But there's loads left hanging by this. You know, it, it, it almost... Again, it raises that question of to what extent would a belief in God solve existential issues? And if so, through what mechanism is, is he doing it? Partly because existential issues have persisted throughout theistic societies as well. And also just because it, we often just take that for granted. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'd like, I'm not saying it's definitely false. I'm just saying it might not be true. And, and it seems to be such a, such a glossed over assumption in the whole discussion, no, this idea I, of... Um, it, it is. I've even glossed it over. And this is something that I would pride myself on thinking a lot about is, yeah, you're right. I mean, God does not inherently solve He's presented as the solution, and if you don't think too far or you buy in immediately to a religious doctrine, then yeah, it does. And actually, sorry, I'm thinking out loud here, so let me, no, no, let's see what, what happens here. I was kind of thinking as you were talking that he may not solve it anymore, but he used to. And I, I think it's a perspective shift that we have had. We, we've seen this throughout history and, and time that culturally people value things differently than they did in the past. My example of this would be, you know, you look at the book of Job, which is a, another piece of wisdom literature. And I think there's kind of an old school Christian that latch onto a story like that differently than we today latch onto that story. They latch onto the story as, yes, of course, the only answer is that God is sovereign. It wasn't about being loved by God. It wasn't about God having a plan for your life. It was about the reality to them. It's almost Camus' stark absurdism that you have to get on board with. The reality that you had to get on board with was God can do whatever he wants, will do whatever he wants, and we are here for his will. Which, you know, if you're talking to a Christian in America right now, and you say something like this to them, they're not going to like it. They might kind of agree with it or know it in the back of their mind, but it's going to be littered with out of context verses from Jeremiah about how God knew me when I was in the womb and has a plan for me and loves me and wants to have a personal relationship with me. And we've brought in certain things that are scripturally there, but we've changed them, I think, to a certain degree to make this God something that becomes more contradictory in nature. You can't have a sovereign God that will do whatever he wants to fulfill his will that also is your best friend and loves you and desires for your joy because your joy doesn't matter if you're a tool to his end. And again, I think older Jewish tradition and early Christian fathers really understood that point that we've maybe lost culturally. And so a book like this might have solved that. It might have been the it, it might have very well relieved the tension of, yep, like we knew, even though we don't like it and it might sound absurd, fear and obey God. But now I think that hits the Christian ear so poorly. And I think it's also why we have a big deconstruction and deconversion movement is because we can't square these things anymore. And by the way, I'm not advocating that they were right back then. I think it is a horrendous slave mentality to say there's something bigger than me and more powerful than me, and thus I am its servant. So it's I'm not defending how it used to be thought, but at least in the old thought, there was the resolution you could get from books like Job and books like Ecclesiastes that now seem so out of place. I guess is is maybe my point. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the the the, the fear God and obey His commandments is is is. I mean, it's not saying it is what it is, but 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 it, it's it it almost feels like it saying that. You know, so that that sort of yeah. Again, again, it, it it I like I like the fact that it that it hits the modern ear as slightly unsatisfying because I you know I think I think that dissatisfaction normally raises an interesting question. 
And I think, yeah, I think the interesting question here is, you know, to yeah, to what extent does belief in God or just a belief in the beyond solve an existential issue? And uh, just because, I, yeah, again, I think it's, it's an assumption that's often made. And I suspect that it's, and I say I'm not saying that it, that it definitely doesn't, but I suspect that it might require more argumentation than it's often given credit for. You know, especially recently, we've had this sort of cultural Christianity thing pop up. It's nice dialectically because it, it, it makes me feel like, you know, ah, it's nice. I've got, I've got something to bounce off, as an, or, or bounce off of as an atheist. But um, but philosophically, that's one of the assumptions that I see in, 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 in when some people are talking about that to kind of, oh, we've had the, you know, we need to go back to, to certain religious teachings. And some think, okay, that's fine. But like embedded in that is the assumption that a belief in God will solve these nihilistic problems. And I don't necessarily think that's true. And as I think you've raised a really interesting point there, which is that it might have been true at one point. Yeah, the more that I think about example after example, you know, when God supposedly delivers the Israelites in the Exodus, he takes them out of captivity, bad, right? And he brings them into freedom, but it's not freedom. He forces them, he controls them, he tells them where to go. He leads them physically by a pillar of cloud or pillar of fire. He feeds them or chooses not to feed them at certain times. He waters them or not waters them. And he says, I brought you out of slavery to be my slaves in so many words. And yeah, there's always this tangential promise of the promised land, but many people in that first generation, all of them actually, don't reach it. They're not allowed to as punishment. And he could have done this forever. You know, the very fact that we do get any kind of promised land, it still doesn't work out. It's not nirvana. It's not utopia, like what is promised. They're at war and have been at war for the last few thousand years, defending this land and not getting the milk and honey result that was promised to them. It's not even true in the in the way that I think is very useful, like the meta truths of Jordan Peterson that tries to argue for the the structure of religious thought and scripture is yeah, it's not <laughs> it's not no, true, it's a, Brandon, but you know, like it's useful. It, again, it's one of those things I think there's something in it, right? Because I, I, I think that fictional narratives can be very useful. You know, I'm a huge for fan sure. of Dostoevsky, and I think yes. that like that can be really, really useful. Um, Let's talk about that for two seconds because I love talk. I don't have a lot of people in my life that also read a lot, yet alone classics. Just humor me. What is your favorite novel? It would be a toss up between The Brothers Karamazov and The Idiot, which I know loads of people really don't like The Idiot, but I think it's great. <laughs> I didn't like it the first time I read it, and then I watched enough people talk about why it's great and why I wasn't <laughs> smart enough to enjoy it, and now I enjoy it very much, right? I mean, pretend that I do. I just absolutely, I love, I love the kind of overarching theme of this character's so kind, uncomplicatedly kind, and everything goes horribly wrong. And at the end, it's like, well, should he have done anything different? And, you know, in context, Dostoevsky's answer is no, it was, it was worth him being kind, despite the fact that it blew up in his face. Because I think that a lot of the time, you know, people uh, like, like in our kind of folk discussions of kindness, you know, we tend to say things like, oh, well, you know, what comes around goes around. That's not necessarily true, right? Like, and, and I think that one of the things the idiot does wonderfully is, is to say, actually, no, sometimes what comes around just doesn't go around. Sometimes you're very kind and and and, and you attempt to be, you know, in Dostoevsky's terms, Christ-like, and, and you know, you try to be moral and principled and everything, and, and it just doesn't work. It just goes horribly wrong. <laughs> and 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 you know, him him affirming at the end, you know, in like I said, in the context of wider philosophy, um, him going, no, it was, it was still worth it despite all of that. I just love that, and also the brothers Karamazov. Um, yeah, partly. I think it, you you almost it just, have to it's say just that. brilliant. <laughs> There's nothing else like it. I mean, Alyosha almost makes me want to be faithful again. I mean, it's just so beautifully written his faith that even for all the things that I hate about certain religious indoctrination and the wool over the eyes aspect of it, it's so fervent and beautiful. And of course, Ivan has just the wonderfully other stark side, even if he wrote mm. Ivan a little bit unfair and uncharitable to yeah. show how wrong and evil atheists are. But let's get back on track. So time. I think that all good existential philosophy deals with time, whether it is how short it is or getting to a place of immortality, the fear of death, all of these things are encompassed in this work as well. I'm curious to hear your personal thoughts on this huge subject, as well as what you think the end result of Ecclesiastes is when it comes to time. I think in terms of time generally, I feel like um, it's difficult because in some ways, existentially, it seems like we can have both too much and too little time. You know, right. I mean, classically, people go, well, one human life, that's kind of churlish. I want more than that. But then, you know, uh, Christianity does a lot of hard work to make immortality seem pleasant. Like this uh, eternal union with God. Without that, immortality is a really horrifying prospect. Like if you sit down and think about it, the, uh, the, the, the immortality of Christianity, I think, I think there's a good reason why it's often conceived as timeless rather than, you know, linear and forever oh, interesting yeah um and i you know I, I think part of that is is because actually yeah the, the idea of linear forever time is absolutely 
terrifying. I, so I, I, I tend to conceive of my own fear of death as a sort of existential FOMO, where I go, well, what's the, what's the thing that I feel like I'm missing out on? It's like, well, I don't, I don't necessarily fear non-existence. What I want is more life. And I want enough life until I have a, a, a chunk of life that I go, okay, that's enough life now. And, and I'm done. I, I'm happy to slip away into non-existence now. What's a good amount of time to live? If oh, I, have, I have no idea. Well, it's interesting because I, I say I have a lot of elderly friends and a lot of them are really happy with the amount of time they've had. And I sometimes mm. wonder, like, well, I get to like, 70, Maybe they're happy with it though, because at 70 or 80, the body's breaking down to such a degree that you you change your mind about welcoming the end. Well, yeah, like and in, it could in be a that perfect state. Yeah, it could be that. And it could also be just the, just the fact that you know death is is inevitable and sooner, so you may as well be happy with this chunk yeah. because it's all that one's getting. So you know, there, there, I think there's that aspect of it too. But no, I I, I don't know. I thought like for me, I always think, oh yeah, I'd like two human lifetimes. But then I get to that and I'd be like, oh no, maybe three. It depends what kind of human life you have. I mean. You know, people who watch my channel will know that I I do disagree with you slightly that Christianity has done a good job describing heaven as a place where people want to be. I think the main attraction of heaven is that it's not hell. I don't think that it's actually been thought out very well past that. I think it's just this, oh, I'm not burning alive forever. Or yeah, I'm so that. afraid of not existing. Hey, I'm still existing. And supposedly mm. it'll be perfect because it says it'll be perfect. I have a whole video on seven reasons why heaven doesn't make sense that a lot of people feel very strongly about one way or another. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's my most popular video. It's the one with the most views and it's the one that most people have done reactions to. And I had a, a really good conversation with Trent Horn, who's a Catholic apologist. Oh, yes. I think he's, he's popped up on, on my YouTube recommended. Mm. Yeah. And, and we talked for a couple hours about, you know, he obviously would be an advocate of heaven and, and I was trying to play the devil's advocate advocate, so to speak, for that. And eternity in general, I think, is something that we don't, we cannot conceive of well enough to say it could be good. I think we have to take mm. almost the negative position that it is inherently bad. Have you ever read with your um, your interest, Jorge Luis Borges? Uh, no, no, the no, short no, I haven't. Okay. He's a short story writer. You should check him out. Probably the best short story author of all time. Honestly, like object, like oh, I know amazing. I'm saying it's objective. It's got to be an objective fact at this point. Like Borges is- Oh, nice. Um, Amazing. But he has a short story called The Library of Babel, and he goes into the math of infinity, if you will, uh, very quickly, the shortest that you can do. And there's been a lot of work that has been built off since there. There's a, uh, to anyone listening, I would recommend A Short Stay in Hell is a book of fiction by a Mormon that is playing off the idea of the Library of Babel, where someone's hell is to be stuck in a library and they have to find the book that perfectly reads their life to escape. And the first 20,000 years, they haven't even found a book with one word in it. Because if the books are made up of anything that could be from the 26-letter right, yeah, yeah. alphabet, you get to the point where you do the math and, and it, the book, the, the short stay in hell does it better than even the short story. 20 billion, 20 trillion years is 0% of infinity. And so, you know, time is one of the most interesting things to me. And one of the things that I really like about Ecclesiastes is it's depromotion of time. And especially without this idea of heaven or hell, it is just Sheol. It's one of the things that I like the most that Ecclesiastes, I think, kind of got right, that is this, whatever you perceive reality to be, however long you'd want of it, however good or meaningless or meaningful you think it is, at some point you're going to want it to be done. <laughs> and guess what? That's all that happens. You're going to go lie in the dirt with everybody else. And I think it's a really sad story to tell yourself when you're 24 or 35 or 70. But I think that it is one of the most eternal truths that the book picked up on, in my opinion, so far in my life. And I love it for that. But you said something earlier that you took it a little differently, that it was promoting immortality. Did I hear you right on that? Oh, it's in more, more in the sense that um, this, this like the, the, the struggle with immortality or the struggle with, with, with mortality about mm. how, um, you know, the, the, the wise and the foolish will eventually be the same because they'll both be dead. Mm. That's sort of the thing, the kind of the kind of annihilating nature of sure. mortality yeah. um, as, 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 as at least a challenge. But yes, no, 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 but I, I, it's, it's interesting. Again, I'm currently in a philosophical position where, where I fear death, but I don't fear mortality. I wouldn't want to die now, but I yeah. want to die at some point. You know? <laughs> well, th there's the existential issue of being alive, I guess, being a human. Yeah, I don't want to die now either, but I don't want to live forever. And I have no yeah, idea yeah. what and the and proper there, there also, again, that, that, that kind of conflicts with, with something that the other thing he says, which is better to die than to live and better to not be born than to be born. You know, uh, I, I do think that Ecclesiastes to me reads in this kind 
kind of dialectical fashion, despite the fact that it's not a dialectic? I guess one thing I'm curious about, we've hit the lottery in terms of being a human. We're, again, just the time and place that we're born, not born as slaves, not born to severe poverty. You're not starving to death. We have access to education. Like we've hit the the lottery for what this life can be. And I think both of us have said we're, we're content, we're happy, and we don't want to die right now. But I do wonder if from a more human perspective of considering the whole, like I want to balk at Ecclesiastes saying it's better to die than live, but that's because I'm me. And if I was a three-year-old starving to death, I would not think that. And I do wonder if Mm. on the whole, is it correct? Would it be better? Like this is kind of the anti-natalist argument. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But like truly, if we can escape like our own bias of wanting to be here because we're already here and it happens to have worked out thus far is it actually better not to be here? What What do you think philosophically on those kinds of ideas? Whether it's better to live or die, I think will be will be pretty situational. The, but if you can only choose one, you can choose existence <laughs> for people. You can only choose life or, or death. Yeah, you're, you're Thanos and you can snap yeah, yeah. that no one ever has to live. So even the people that benefit won't benefit, but the people that suffer won't suffer. Like, is it truly better non-existence than existence? Because I think that is the question in this book and it's given an mm. answer. It's saying like, for whatever reason, God did put us through this, but it would be better to die. And I think it's because there's some reconciliation internally with the belief system that even if it is just talking about Sheol, you're at least going back. You're like the great magnet. You're going back to what was and non-existence is the state we came from. Like to return is to arrive, I guess. Sorry to hit you with the world's biggest philosophical no, no, question, no, no, no. but I, is I, I existence no, no, but, better than non-existence? But no, but this this does this does have me completely stumped. I, I, I genuinely have no idea. I mean, I think that there, there are, I, I'm familiar with some cursory kind of anti natalist arguments, like the kind of a symmetry thing where they say, you know, um, pain is, I can't remember exactly how it goes, but but in some way preventing pain is more significant than, than allowing for pleasure. Oh, sure. Yeah. And, you know, there, there's, which I, you know, there, there are some, I can't remember the exact um, details of the arguments, but, you know, I remember thinking, oh, that's plausible. You know, I, I, I kind of skimmed over it. So I, I, I'd say I don't know that much about it, antinatalism. Intuitively, I want to say something like, and this is partly stemming from an atheist position, the idea of it being better for nobody to exist. At the moment that that happens, the concept of better and worse will kind of cease to be sensible. So I, I almost don't know. It seems like a, a problem of perspective because I, when I think of nobody existing, I'm kind of surreptitiously inserting myself in there as to a judge witness. Yeah. whether that's whether that's better or worse. Yeah. So I'm not sure, and I, I think I think that in some ways it, it's it's kind of a, it'll be it'll be an interesting conceptual problem to pose that question in a way that gets at what it would mean for nobody to exist. Yeah, it it, it is hard to not have a witness to it. And I think the reason why it's maybe becoming, and this is probably biting off too much, but the reason why that idea and that concept and that question is becoming more important is because we're becoming God in what we create. If we can get to a point, who cares if it's next year or a billion years, at some point we're theoretically going to be able to create something that maybe is aware that it's been created. In which case we have the same authorship and responsibility as God. And so we should probably figure out this question for him, what we think he should have done before we start doing what we're mad about him doing. And for the first time in history, I think we're at a point where we can say that we could potentially someday recreate this whole thing, which would then make us responsible for its outcome, which we've previously never had the responsibility or could envision the responsibility. No, but it's given me something to think about. Yeah. I suppose it's interesting. So I feel like, again, you, you're right, that because there is a, a distinction between the question of, is it is existence on average better than non-existence? Should one as an individual have children? But yes, no, that's an interesting question, though. Well, we can just end with that horrible cliffhanger of not <laughs> knowing whether we should be here or not. But I do want to say thank you for the conversation. I do want to say for anyone that happens to know of me and doesn't know of you from my channel, please go check Joe out. His videos are absolutely fantastic. I think you'll learn a lot and really happy to have gotten to to speak with you. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you. And likewise, I, I really enjoy it. I've been following your um, your secular Bible study mm. playlist. I've been, well, unfortunately, very, that means you've just heard about Paul for the last 14 weeks in a row. Corinthians is, is an interesting book. We could, we could do another one on Corinthians. Actually, I've got a lot of thoughts on that. But yeah, no, the, but yes, no, thank you so much for having me on. Yep, absolutely. And, um, until next time, we'll, uh, we'll talk yes, to you Yes, until next time. Wonderful. See you later. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support. My Iconoclist, Boris, GVI, Jacob, Joe, Kit Boga, Martin, Oliver, Perry, Rocket, and Sean. My Humanist Heroes, Imposter, James, Jared, and Christy. My Atheist Advocates, Caleb, Jeff, Jeffrey, Karen, Maggie, Paul, Sparky, and Todd, as well as all of my Secular Scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of the channel or you just enjoy the content, please consider joining these fine people.